Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Lynn O'Grady and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. This is a third webinar in the series of Borderline Personality Disorder and tonight's topic is evidence-based treatments for people living with borderline personality disorder. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia where webinar presenters and participants are located. We should pay respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. So this is um, an important series. Hopefully you've been aware of the previous webinars that we've, we've had and that we also have a number of webinars yet to come. So tonight is, is one of the opportunities to answer some of your questions and we know there are lots of questions. We have um, about 700 people joining us live um, at the moment, so welcome to all of you and welcome to our, our panellists as well. Um, I usually work with the Australian Psychological Society in my, my day job, so I um, manage strategic projects at the um, Society and I really enjoy the opportunity to facilitate these, these webinars with MHPN and find that they're, they're very um, useful opportunities for people to undertake professional development. We do have, as I mentioned, um, a panel tonight. So we have a panel of people, as we always do, if you're familiar with MHPN webinars, you'll, you'll know that we have um, a panel and these are people who represent, as you can see, a range of different perspectives and that's one of the, the real benefits, I think, of the MHPN webinars is that we do have a, an opportunity to bring some different perspectives together. We have a case study that hopefully you've had a chance to read, hopefully you've had a chance to, to read the bios of, of the panel members as well and hopefully the case study, but I'll do a bit of a recap of the case study um, before we, we, move, um, we move too far along. So this is um, webinars that are funded, as you can see, by the Australian Government and these are the webinars that are coming up. So the first two webinars covered um, what is borderline personality disorder and some of the statistics and some of the current um, thinking around that and the last webinar, if you didn't join us, covered some of the general principles around um, treatment and, and the importance of the relationship. And you can see there that after this one, we've got webinar four coming up in July and I'll give you the date at the end, which is going to have a focus on youth and early intervention. And then you can see webinar five around self-injury and suicidality and then webinar six, management in mental health services, primary and private sector. So I know that a lot of you will have questions around some of those topics, so I need you to hold on to those and come back to, to future webinars to get those answered. And if you've got questions relating to the first couple of webinars, it'd be great for you to have a look at those. They're available on the, on the MHPN website as well, so you're able to, to tap back into those. And, um, and get that information. So we want to really keep focused on, on what it is we're talking about tonight for our, our particular topic. I'm also really mindful when we do webinars, they are fabulous um, professional development opportunities. We can get a whole lot of you together and you get the opportunity to, to hear the panel and engage with us. But we do also um, acknowledge that you are um, on your own, we can't see you out there. So we really want to remind you around your own self-care and we know that whenever we're doing any kind of webinar or any kind of professional learning around mental health issues that, that, that it can impact in lots of different ways for us. It is a professional development event but that's not to say that we don't need to look after ourselves as well. So reminder always that you think about your own self-care plan and what works for you but also um, Lifeline of course, 131114 and below if necessary and Beyond Blue, um, 1300 226 so really important that you um, sort of prepare for that. If finding tonight's session gets a little bit too much, you can always come back. There'll be a recording that will come later. So you can always follow up with that. You don't have to sit through the whole, whole lot tonight if, if you're finding it's a bit, a bit hard going. We will now introduce um, the panel, I think. So you can see them there. And without further ado, I think it's time to introduce them. So let's begin with you, Martha. So Dr. Martha Kent, she's a psychiatrist and she's from South Australia. Hi Martha and welcome. Hi Lynn, thank you. We've got a, a question for you. So you were telling us last week when we had, a, had a, a session to prepare for tonight about some recent developments in South Australia in relation to borderline personality disorder services. Would you like to quickly fill us in on, on what's happening over your way? Yes, certainly. For the last 10 years, uh, we, a small group of advocates in South Australia have been protesting uh, the state of services here for borderline personality and pushing to, uh, for an improvement in those services. 
And then fortunately, um, and possibly fortuitously, late last year, with a combination of a coronial inquest, a, an election coming, and Kelly Vincent doing a, a hard deal with Tom Kutsantonis, we have been uh, offered, uh, and of course we have accepted, $10 million, $10.25 million in the state of South Australia to develop a statewide South Australian borderline personality disorder service. Wow, that sounds amazing. That sounds fabulous. And everyone else would be very jealous of that. But hopefully it's a good opportunity to say, well, South Australia are doing it. What about other places? So great work. It sounds, sounds really promising. And I guess when we're talking tonight, it's sort of knowing that's coming makes it a bit more hopeful, I guess, in terms of services that can reach people. So that's, that's great news. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll be hearing from you very soon. My pleasure. Let's move on to Pip now. Pip Bradley is a mental health nurse and Pip is from Victoria. And Pip, you've been doing, as, um, as Martha has, you've been doing this work with borderline personality disorder clients for quite some time. What is it that you find yeah. satisfying with working with, with people with this borderline personality disorder? Oh, well, Lynn, um, and good evening, everyone. Um, I come from a background of nursing and general nursing, actually, initially. And when I moved into mental health nursing, I immediately found that I enjoyed working with people with borderline personality disorder. I liked the way that I could make a difference to them in their, not only their daily lives with their struggles daily, but also with their longer term kind of um, emotional difficulties and helping them to establish a life that, that was meaningful for them. I think that uh, we think about borderline personality disorder as featuring emotion and re relationship difficulties and really they're the same problems that, that we all have to varying degrees in our lives and so their issues are really relatable and I kind of enjoyed that, found that I could understand it and work well with it and I, so I continue to do the work. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to you sharing some of those those ways of working and, and again some of the some of the things that, that you've found over, over that time. So really looking forward to hearing from you um, soon as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Fred Ford. So Fred is a carer and one of the things about this series is that we have had consumer and carer representation on each of the webinars so far and that's a really important part of the way that, that we work and really important to have the voice of, of people like you, you Fred, to, to keep us, I guess, focused on that as well and to make sure that we're being, being aware and holistic in the way that we work. So aside from caring for your loved one, what are some of the things that you've been doing in the borderline personality disorder space? Um, well, one of the things I've done, I was actually the care representative on the National Mental Health Research Council's uh, guidelines committee for BPD. Um, I've also been a keynote speaker at the Victorian BPD conference. Um, I've done DBT training. I've also trained as a family connections facilitator, um, as well as um, some other sort of local work as well. Yeah, fantastic. That's kept you pretty busy then, which is which is fabulous. And again, great that you're joining us tonight to bring that particular perspective from a carer's carer's point of view. You mentioned the guidelines, and we'll probably come back to those again, but they're, they're docu a document that I'll well, give you a link later on for people to connect with, but are really important, and particularly with those questions that you might have that we know we're not going to get to answer all of them tonight. Those guidelines are a really useful document for, for people to get information. It, it has quite a lot on the evidence base and a lot on practical kinds of um, information that I think people will find really useful. So great work being part of that, that group as well. All right, so thank you, Fred, and we'll, we'll get to you soon as well. So let's um, have a bit of a look at our ground rules. This is always important when we're talking about um, webinars and how we run. If, you, if you're familiar with webinars and with the MHPN webinars, you'll, you'll know this because they're, they're important, but they're also quite standard. Um, we don't have um, our chat function that we often have. So often when we have events, we do have a chat function that people can see each other's conversations. And in that case, that, that's where that that part, that first point is really important. We, we have a question um, opportunity so people can answer, ask some questions and that will be, they'll be sent through to me um, to look at as much as we can in the time that we have. 
Um, but because of the large numbers, it's just a bit difficult to manage such a big chat. We have over 1,200 people who are joining us now, so that number, as you can see, is increasing. So, um, but, you know, just be mindful. There are people there. If you do have questions, you can ask those. And obviously, being respectful is always good. In technical um, difficulties, if they arise, and um, we've got great support from Redback to help desk. So you can see that there, there is a technical chat um, button that you'll be able to see, and also a phone number there. So if there's any kind of technical problems, um, please make sure that you use that, and they will do their very best to um, help you. And most most they can be resolved. So, um, yeah, we're really well supported by, by people um, who are there to do that. As I said, we will talk about um, some resources at, at the end so that you um, make sure you've got access to information. And if you do have questions that we haven't been able to answer, you'll have information to go away with. We'll also ask you at the end for some feedback. So we do really value your feedback. We use it. Obviously, we've got three more webinars to prepare for. So we really take on board what you have to say. And obviously, for funding purposes, it's also really important. So that will that will come up a bit later on. Our learning outcomes for this evening, and you would have seen this when you registered, but just as a bit of a recap and just to keep us all focused, including me, um, what we'll be doing tonight is through an exploration of borderline personality disorder, the webinar will provide participants with the opportunity to identify the evidence-based treatments for the borderline personality disorder, outline the limitation and the lack of available services to access evidence-based treatment. So we're already flagging that that's the case, except in South Australia when that project rolls out. And to identify the core principles and example of an evidence-based treatment for BPD and dialectical behaviour therapy. And Fred's already preempted that by mentioning that. So we'll be focusing on that. We know that people really like to have some, some really um, clear ideas to go away with and to really um, make sense of in these webinars. So we will be doing that. You can see there the little in the little um, writing, there's an audience tip, the PowerPoint slideshow and case study can be found in the resources library at the bottom right, I think that says. So make sure you um, access that and you can follow along with us. I will just uh, do a brief recap of the case study though. Hopefully you have read it, but just as a bit of a, a recap of that, we're going to be talking about a case study that's been made up but based on people's experiences. The person we'll be talking about is Liz and she's a 27 year old woman. She lives in a rural country town and she's lived there for three years and she went there three years ago um, for a fresh start when things weren't going so well. There's a history of having a poor relationship with her mother and her brother and she's been seeing a psychologist for some months. She's got some difficulty sleeping, she's done some medication for that. Um, there's some alcohol use, there's some self-harm, there's been a recent um, argument with her, with her family. So that's the situation that we're going to um, be focusing on where we're appropriate tonight. And I think we should get into the presentation. So let's kick off with you, Martha. So let's hear from a psychiatrist. Hello, everyone. Uh, over the past 20 to 30 years, the treatment of borderline personality disorder has swung between two extremes. For many decades in the 1900s, it was thought to be treatable only by psychoanalysis, which put it out of the reach of most patients and many clinicians. It was long, it was expensive, it was very specialised, and essentially borderline personality disorder developed a reputation then for being untreatable. But then in the 1990s, Marsha Linehan burst onto the scene with her innovative, pragmatic, eclectic approach to the treatment of borderline personality disorder, namely DBT or dialectical behaviour therapy. And since then there's been a plethora of talking treatments which have become available and all have proved approximately equivalently effective. And on that slide you can see um, the first four which uh, include dialectical, behaviour therapy, mentalisation based, transference focused and schema focused therapy. And then, uh, but there are others, wait there are others. Uh, there's something called STEPS which you can see is systems training for emotional predictability and problem solving, CBT, cognitive analytic therapy, ACT and the conversational model which was developed by Russell Mears in Sydney and is used predominantly on the east coast of Australia. The asterisks in these slides refer to the psychotherapies which are considered to be evidence-based according to a recent review. And I've put the um, title of the or details about that recent review on the final slide. 
Uh, it's a recent review of treatment approaches to borderline personality disorder over the past five years, and I recommend it to you. There's really no real difference between the outcomes in all these treatments. So we've gone from not much to an awful lot of treatment, in fact. People describe DBT as it relates to Liz and her situation in more detail. And I would like to just briefly describe the principles of MBT, or mentalization-based therapy. So mentalization is uh, defined as the capacity to uh, recognize and accurately label, that is to interpret accurately the thoughts, the inner thoughts and feelings in one's own mind and in the minds of others. The conceptualization of MBT is rooted in attachment theory and the focus of MBT is to strengthen the patient's capacity to mentalize, particularly uh, when she's feeling stressed, particularly when there are threats to her attachment system or there are relationship challenges going on in her life, whether it's in the therapy room or whether it's in real life. Because when patients feel under threat, they become emotionally aroused and they often lose the capacity to mentalize. Now in order to facilitate mentalization, the therapist is trained to adopt the stance of curiosity and of not knowing, uh, which can be unfamiliar to many of us to encourage the patient to assess and interact in any interpersonal situation more flexibly, more kindly, and in a more grounded way. So with Liz, she was tending to mentalize her mother's motives when her mother delayed responding to her needs, narrowly and harshly, and she was quite certain that her mother's motives and intentions towards her were negative and rejecting, unloving and uncaring, uh, and this was based around her interpretation of her mother's behaviour. Now, time does not allow me to explore all of the other forms of specialised therapy that you saw on the slide, but it is very clear that all of these treatments require considerable training, expertise, and ongoing supervision and support. This is a very expensive process. And therefore, when you think about it, not really applicable or able to be accessed by the wider community uh, or the Australian population as a whole. We know, don't we, that drugs have not been shown to be effective in changing the core symptoms of borderline personality disorder and multiple studies have attested to that. They can assist in ameliorating some of the uh, more intense symptoms of BPD and are uh, often used to treat comorbid illnesses, but that is recommended as a short-term option only, at least theoretically. So how can we address the need for good enough population-wide treatment of BPD? Well, happily, there are a couple of more generalist developments in this area which offer hope in this regard and have shown significant clinical promise and the one that I think is most uh, popular is called GPM, or Good Psychiatric Management for BPD, and it was developed by John Gunderson in the USA. And the model that it's based on is a model of BPD as reflecting heightened interpersonal sensitivity, especially in emotionally charged interactions or social situations. It fits nicely into a case management model and therefore it has wide applicability in public mental health settings. It focuses on the patient's life outside therapy rather than exploring in detail their inner dynamics or the nature of the therapeutic relationship. But it does aim to provide a good enough holding environment uh, in the relationship with the therapist. It overtly focuses on the expectation of change in life with improvement in social and work functioning. Thus it prioritizes work and better relationships in general across the board over love and romance. It's very flexible. It can be uh, as short or as long as needed. Uh, it's very pragmatic and it, it includes psychoeducation for the patient and the family and group therapy. Any group therapy will do. So this approach offers considerable promise, particularly for public mental health services in Australia. 
But uh, there are other approaches that are being developed as well. Uh, another way forward in terms of affordability and accessibility uh, is uh, to simplify the more specialised forms of treatment which already exist and to make them more user friendly and simple and uh, uh, cost effective across the board. And this approach is also showing promise in clinical trials. So I suppose the approach this generates is to start with the more general types of therapy initially and if and when they fail to move on to the more specialised ones, at least in an ideal world. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention and concentration. And the last slide uh, that I have uh, shows some references for you if you want to pursue these ideas in more detail. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks, Martha. A lot of information there that um, you covered in a, in a really short time frame. And I'm sure people have got lots of, lots of questions as well and would love to hear a little bit more. And, and people will pick up on some of those. But we do have one quick question that Ty has asked, which is specific to your presentation. Can Martha please outline the difference between standard DBT and DBT with case management? So is that something you can give a fairly quick response to? Well, I think the, the usefulness of DBT is that it can be applied in many different clinical situations, uh, theoretically. Um, so for people in private practice, say, or patients in private practice, they would presumably access private therapy with a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but be referred to a DBT group. And that would be standard DBT group. And then the, the therapist would arrange their own supervision and support and look at crisis management. But in the public mental health service, generally where they tend to care for people who have the more severe end of BPD, then um, clearly DBT can be tailored to fit into a case management model and that would include uh, DBT trained therapists, supervision in the public service, crisis management pathways often articulated in a crisis plan as well as support for the therapists involved. So I think it's really the same process, just different location with a bit of tweaking here and there, depending on uh, what is the need. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And you preempted another question, which is around short-term crisis admission still considered an appropriate intervention. So there's, there seems to be people kind of starting to think about what might this mean. So you did mention that sometimes crisis response might be part of, part of that. So we might, we might move on to Pip and we might come back. Hopefully we'll have some time for some question and answer. We might be able to pick up on some of that a little bit more as well. So thank you very much, Martha, for that really um, great affirming um, message, I guess, in terms of the range of evidence-based treatments that are there now. So it hopefully gives people a real sense that there are, there are ways for them to find a place for them, themselves and their own, their own work and um, opportunities to, to do this work as well as they can. So let's move on to you now, Pip. You're going to give us a perspective from a mental health nurse. Yes. Great. So I'm using DBT, Dialectical Behaviour Therapy, as an example of an evidence-based treatment to use with Liz. And I'll kind of intertwine explaining little bits about DBT and also how I would use it with Liz throughout my, my talk. Um, just briefly starting with what DBT is, is about. It's based, well DBT basically understands borderline personality disorder as an emotion dysregulation disorder. Emotion dysregulation is the core problem. And uh, it's based on a biosocial theory of understanding what causes this bias, the emotion dysregulation. The biological part of the biosocial theory, though, in DBT, thinks about a person having an emotional vulnerability, an innate emotional vulnerability that they were born with. And that vulnerability can take three different forms. It can be they have a heightened sensitivity to emotional stimuli. That means they they notice more emotional stimuli, they perceive more. So that means they react, they have more frequent and um, they experiences of emotions, they react more frequently. The next type of vulnerability is a heightened arousal once they do notice an emotional stimulus. So their arousal can go up quite high, higher than for a person who wasn't sensitive. And then the final type of vulnerability 
as a slow return to baseline. So once they do have a state of emotional arousal, it can take quite a long time to return to baseline. Now there's nothing wrong with any of these per se, um, but the combination of them is difficult for a person, especially when they may have had the social part of the biosocial theory, there were difficulties for them um, in learning skills and having their emotions regulated during their development. Um, Many of us as mental health clinicians may come into this work with a sensitive nature, it's often what brings us in, but generally we don't also have the heightened arousal and the slow return to baseline. So when, this is, when we have the social and biological vulnerabilities, the transactions of these over time influence both the child and the parent, they make the child more sensitive, more withdrawn, perhaps more difficult to soothe, and over time the caregiver gets more more withdrawn, more critical, even more abusive if that's the initial problem. So the person in their childhood isn't developing skills to manage um, the things that we have to learn how to manage, particularly emotions and relationships in their childhood, because for one thing their emotional arousal is generally quite high and they're not getting those skills taught to them within an invalidating environment. None of us can learn skills when our emotional arousal is too high. So in starting work with Liz, I would actually explain aspects of this biosocial theory to her. I would communicate that I, the things that she is struggling with make sense to me in terms of her past experience and her nature. Taking care to explain there's nothing actually wrong with her nature, there's nothing wrong with being sensitive. Um, it's a common trait to have, but when it's combined with difficulties in learning how to manage the, the resulting emotions and stresses that a person has, then it can cause a lot of difficulty for the person through life. Do this in a very non-blaming way um, so that Liz can understand that she has to work on solving her problems herself. I always also communicate this in a very um, compassionate um, and validating way so that she's understanding that I'm on her side throughout. So um, moving on to the next aspect of DBT I want to talk about, dialectical behaviour therapy. Dialectical just means that we're synthesising apparent opposites, finding balance between opposing positions and the main dialectic we work with or the main balance in DBT is between validation and change or acceptance and change. So the acceptance side we provide through validation, you're okay the way you are. The change side is and yet you still have to make changes in your life, you have to do something differently. And starting work with Liz, the focus would need to be on validation um, to help her to stay in the treatment. So how would I validate Liz? I can talk with her um, about um, how she has tried so many things herself. She's, um, she's worked on, she, she made several changes in her life. She moved uh, locations to go to an area, a rural area. She's seeing the GP, she's seeing a psychiatrist, she's taking medications. She's trying really hard to work on her problems. It just hasn't been changing for her. I also validate just that I accept and listen to everything she says and I'm trying to communicate that I'm on her side. I'm not here to criticise her. I'm here to actually help and make a difference for her. And then how to help using DBT. Well, the ultimate goal in DBT is for a person to develop a life worth living. We're very target and goal oriented in DBT. That the theory is that what we target does change. So if we target self-harm and addiction and other problem behaviours, they will change over time. And if we establish with a person at the start of treatment that they um, that they need to have goals to be working on themselves, then for the life that they want, then then it helps them to understand why we work on the targets. So if Liz wants to have meaningful relationships in her life, if she wants to have a partner, a family, she needs to learn how to manage her work on relationships with people even at work, in her workplace. Um, the skills and the individual therapy that we do in DBT help her to move towards those goals. So in her case, verbally attacking her, her co-workers isn't appropriate, but I would validate her emotion underneath that. 
it sounds like you were feeling very angry or frustrated or maybe she was feeling hurt. Um, but I would also, so initially I would start with the validation. Just to make a mention here that full DBT does include a comprehensive program but in rural and remote areas often people have to do just aspects of DBT or DBT informed therapy and that's very common. Um, but the full, the full DBT includes the modules of emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance and of course mindfulness. Um, so moving on again, the main tool that we have, one of the main strategies in helping a person to make progress within DBT is the chain analysis. It's a moment by moment, step by step analysis of what's led up to a problem behaviour for a person. Each little step or link on the chain becomes an opportunity to develop alternative skills and it helps to increase the person's awareness of their own patterns by looking at all the steps that have been involved. So it's important to know that the therapist is using change and validation throughout chain analysis. Chain analysis itself is a change strategy. We're working on identifying what's going wrong, seeing, seeing where the person needs new skills and new strategies and trying to get them to develop those. So it's very much a change strategy. But if we're not also working on validation throughout the change, we lose, we'll lose the client, they'll disengage from treatment. Liz is at this beginning stage of treatment, is going to need a lot of support to understand why she should keep feeding me or keep doing this hard work. This is what a chain analysis might look like. Now I hope you can actually see that slide on your screens. The font is quite small but at least you can get the idea. I often do it like this with clients on a whiteboard showing kind of bubbles with different steps or different chains on the link and you can start with the actual problem behaviour. So I, this is a hypothetical chain for Liz, starting with a problem behaviour of yelling at her colleagues. The prompting event, which is at the beginning of the chain, is that she saw her co-worker, the one who was promoted above her, laughing with her employer. She immediately felt hurt and, and had thoughts around, I'm not good enough, I get overlooked all the time. Um, but as hurt is a difficult feeling to feel and it often diverts to anger for people, she quickly changes to anger and then has anger thoughts. They don't care about me, they don't like me. As she thinks these thoughts, the anger gets worse and as the anger gets worse, she gets a strong urge to lash out, with it, um, which is the urge that goes with anger and her way of lashing out is to yell at her colleagues or to be uh, communicate verbally attacking them. So she might yell out something like, some of us are trying to work out, can you keep the noise down? And then immediately she feels better after it because the, the acting out, the lashing out kind of relieves the emotional distress but in time she feels worse as, as she realises that she's done it again, she's um, got herself into more difficulty and she, she might, she's probably even worried that she might lose her job. So in DBT we would be using all of the skills to help her on this chain to identify links that, or places where she can do things differently. Mindfulness would help her to be more aware of how she's um, interacting, more aware of how she gets distracted onto what her co-workers are doing and help her to stay focused on herself so that she can calmly work on her own work. But also the mindfulness would also help her to manage her ruminating thoughts at night which are interfering with her sleep. Sleep's a major problem for Liz. It's one of the reasons why she's taking medication and possibly even drinking alcohol at night. So if she can work on skills to manage rumination and to improve her sleep, that would help. Distress tolerance helps to get the high arousal down um, and we have numerous skills. We use intense exercise, we use pace breathing, we use distraction and self-soothing skills to get arousal down. And then emotion regulation skills would help her to stay with the hurt rather than diverting on to anger. Um, it's actually the underlying emotion that needs to be heard and expressed and validated. The hurt is really a, dis sorry, the anger is really a distraction from her feeling of hurt. And um, teaching her that emotions do pass, they're like waves, she can ride the wave of the emotion and the act opposite is my favourite emotion regulation skill. So when she feels like lashing out, 
do something different, go for a walk, get out of the office or distract herself with something else on her computer. The final set of skills we would use to help on this chain is interpersonal effectiveness. However, to start with her, Liz's arousal is so high that she can't really even recognise what she wants to get out of relationships, let alone work on how to communicate effectively, how to validate the other person, how to be fair to others as well as herself. So the first step in managing her relationships is to get that arousal down using distress tolerance. Um, and that way, so at every link in the chain we can work on places she can do things differently and sometimes just changing one link can make a difference to mean that she isn't going to end up doing the problem behaviour. I think I'm out of time, but uh, and if, as in finishing with Liz in our early sessions, I would make a plan with her. I want to keep seeing, I want to keep seeing her. I want her life to help her to, to change her life. Uh, but so I'd be working on her commitment to engaging in DBT treatment, discussing practicing initial strategies and session that she can use, working through a breathing exercise if she finds that helpful, planning further sessions, considering family work and support from her mother, perhaps through family connections or whatever was available in the local area. Um, so that feels like a quick race through DBT, but it's, um, it's enough for the moment and I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Liz. Thanks very much, Pip. There's so much to say in such little time. <laughs> and I called you Liz as well. I'm sorry, Lynn. <laughs> uh, you are not okay. the patient. No, I'm <laughs> Thanks. That's our case study, our makeup person. Um, so <laughs> thank you. There's lots to cover, and I think what you've what you've given is that overview, going a little bit more deeply into DBT. And I think that that chain image, I, th I think, will be really helpful to people to kind of see that pathway and, and the links between between those those sorts of things. You did yes. mention at the end. Um, family and working with the family and that's really timely mm. because here we are now with, with Fred and, and the carer perspective. We've also had a question from Ryan um, that's been tapping into that um, carer role as well given that the carer is, are the people, carers are the people that are there 24-7 when um, practitioners and clinicians might see people for a shorter period of time. So I think that Fred you'll be picking up on some of those points now. So over to you. Uh, good evening everybody. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that personally I don't like the term carer when it comes to mental illness or borderline personality disorder. Carer gives over the connotation of doing for, whereas our role is supporting um, our loved one. And, and that's very important because sometimes we do need to do things for our person but it's also very important to give those responsibilities back as soon as possible. Another thing, emotion can and will play a part in how carers react. And this could be for a number of reasons. And probably the biggest one coming from a rural area myself is difficulty in accessing and maintaining services, as I say, particularly in our areas. Another is frictions within the relationship and we see this in the scenario with Liz and her mother and her brother. Um, it's something that seems to be, um, goes with BPD, um, whereby particularly families who don't have an understanding of the illness can sometimes also misinterpret the reactions of the person they're supporting. And thirdly, the self-harm. It can be very difficult for families to, to deal with and to witness and, and to accept. And I know in my situation that was probably the hardest thing of all was, um, was standing by, seeing this happening and the feeling of helplessness. Carers need support also. And it's important to refer carers to, to support services. And in most areas you have care advocates or support workers. Also there are other services, carer services that you can refer to for support and, and, and things like that as well. Carers need time out to look after themselves. Research has shown that between 60 and 80 percent of all carers develop mental health issues. It's important that carers have their own time away from the care role. And what I usually encourage carers to do is, is to set aside some time in their week, which is their time. 
So I set time, whether it's go out with friends for a coffee or like me, play golf, read book or whatever, but that time is their time. And sometimes they need services to support them in doing that as well. Sorry, I forgot me quick. Carers need BPD specific education as, as such as family connections as well. And it helps them to develop appropriate strategies to support their loved ones. Our care, family connections is based on DBT. So they're learning the strategies that are being taught to their first, to their person, but also it helps them to develop strategies in appropriately supporting their loved one. Carers can feel guilt and blame for their person's illness, which is usually baseless. You might have a situation where, say, a carer has had to go into hospital, there's been nobody else to look after their person, the person's been put into care, they may have been assaulted while they're in care. And that carer can carry that, that guilt um, around with them. So it's important to emphasise for them that it's not their fault and to show them what was the other thing that they had. And the fault lays with the perpetrator, not with them. Care is an integral part of the person's care team and this is important to remember as they're the ones that are on the front line and where appropriate they need to be involved in care planning and know the basics about the person such as diagnosis, medication and care plan. These are the things that help them work with you as professionals along the same lines so that everybody's working together. Some professionals have asked me about confidentiality and how they can overcome this as a clinician and involve the family more. Probably one of the most important things is if the person you are working with um, is saying they don't want their primary care or those closest involved is to not so much argue with them but revisit that over time. Because while consumers have rights, they also have responsibilities and this is something else I say, well, if, if, if John wants Anne to, to support them, then they have a responsibility for those three areas so that they can support them appropriately, such as being involved with the care plan, um, knowing the diagnosis and knowing what the medication re regime is as well. Um, another important thing is develop a care engagement plan while the person is well. Because that, like in our situ in my situation, when my loved one became unwell, then I'd become public enemy number one. And what we did was simply sat down while they were well. We wrote out a plan of what my care role would be. Also, my involvement with the with the professional team, how that would look, how my person was involved with that and the fact that they would be would know about everything that was happening in that situation. This is something all three of us signed, the case manager, myself and my person. And it worked very, very well, particularly when they became unwell. There may be need for family interventions or maintain to repair family relationships and this is something that would probably happen in Liz's case with with her family and a brother, particularly if that was what she wanted. Because as we know, when people have BPD, these personal relationships can and often do become strained. Another area is that um, if there's small children within the household, often um, or at times, family services can become involved and some families actually have to make a decision between the other children and the person they're supporting, so it can become very difficult. If carers become angry, try to find the cause of their anger or their frustration, because quite often what they're presenting with is not actual, actually the cause. And you could think of a situation like where a parent, their son's at home, he's an adult son, um, he's unwell, they're trying to get him to hospital, he becomes angry, he pushes his mother over, then they call the police just to get him to hospital. Police come, they write a report in their day book. The parents say, 
they don't want their son charged. The officer happens to get one of the parents to sign their day book, which then in turn gives him the right to then have charged. So in, if, in that situation, you might have to go and speak to the police liaison officer. And what I've found, situations like that, once they're resolved, then the relationship with the workers and the service also improves. So again, quite often, they might be angry, but what they're angry about is not necessarily with the service, but with something that's happened. So it's important to find out exactly what it is. What can carers do if that person is resisting or refusing treatment? This is very difficult. Um, really, we can only encourage the person to get support, um, support them in attending appointments without overdoing it, um, and working in conjunction with with the service to try and 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 get them to actually go to their appointments. What if they're talking about threatening or self-harm? This is probably the hardest thing. And it was the hardest thing for me to, to deal with was, was this really an act for self-harm or for suicide? Or was this about um, trying to get my attention? And the thing that I learned was, it was important for me to listen to my gut. And if I felt that the situation was serious to do something about it. And there's one thing my person told me that I'll never forget was that they said to me, if you think I need help, get me help. I might abuse you for two or three weeks and then I'll say thank you. So it's, a, it's about learning and, and we all know our person as in family carers. So it's about using that sixth sense to, to really uh, ascertain what's happening there. And the thing I'd like to leave you with is a well-nurtured family or carer can actually be your greatest asset because they are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you have a good relationship, they can give you another insight as to what's happening for the person. Because as we all know, when someone gets into their therapeutic um, um, relationship, they don't always say exactly what's happening. So where there's, there's a good relationship with the carer, you can get that other perspective. And, and I've often said it helps workers to sort the wheat from the chaff. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fred. And again, lots of information covered in a, in a really um, short time. So, so thank you. And I, I guess to me there were a number of things that, that jumped out. One of them is that last point where the carer and family members can play a really important role in supporting the, the patient, the client, by sharing information and, and being able to um, give some insight that, um, that can be really useful to the practitioner who's treating the person. But the need for the carer and the family members to have some support as well. So could you just maybe touch on that and how that, like what you might say to carers around you know, what support they might get for themselves. So you talked about having some time out, but what about some professional support? Is that something you'd be talking to carers about as well? Yeah, um, as I said, in a lot of services today, um, they do actually have uh, family carer, either support workers or um, or carer advocates, as they have, or yeah, care advocates they have in Victoria, uh, New South Wales. Largely, that's done via a community managed organisation, which is called Care Assist. But it's important that 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 carers get that support as well. And what those services or those workers can do is sit down and hear the carer's story and give the carers an opportunity to actually um, talk through what's happening for them. Yeah. Um, quite often these workers have a lived experience as well as carers, so they're able to empathise with them. Um, one thing I did forget was that um, Workers have often said to me about the confidentiality side um, and said to me, how do we identify a primary carer? And usually, as a rule of thumb, I usually say, it's the person they turn to when the proverbial hits the fan. And that's generally their primary carer. Yeah, okay. And you made the point of 
doing some of this planning before things hit the fan. So during the planning early on. Yes, when things are going, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, yep. yep. The other point, and I, I'll open this up to the other panellists as well, is around a, a question that Ms. Rachi, I think you spelled that, say that, I'm sorry if I haven't said that right, but what do people think of the parentification process? So this is that the idea, and you did mention it, Fred, children are young people looking after their parents rather than the other way around. So you did flag that as something that can happen, but I, I guess I'm, I'm interested also in Martha and Pip's perspectives around that in terms of practitioners perhaps looking out for that and, and what sort of um, suggestions they might have around that. Or Fred, if you want to kick off and talk a little bit more about that and what you might say to carers as well about um, supporting their kids, protecting their kids, while also acknowledging the, the role that they play. Yeah, well, I think it's very important because that's what we've spoke about. A lot of relationships become fractured uh, around BBD. So there, and I know like in, in my area, in the rural areas, there are a lot of parents who suffer BPD only have their children there and they're their main supports. So it's important that they're included in what's happening as well and that they have an opportunity to be able to learn about what's happening for their parent or their sibling. Um, and again, sometimes there are there are a young carer supports out there. So and that varies greatly. There's more available in capital cities than there are in, in rural areas, which is something I've tried to get going in my area. Um, but it's just important that they're recognised and they also have the opportunity to to talk about how they feel. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Martha, Pip, would you like to add anything to that or are we happy to move on to some other questions? No, We've got a few. Certainly, certainly I'd like to make a, a couple of comments. Uh, unfortunately, this situation is all too common, but I think most therapists would agree that it's not particularly in the best interest of the development of the minor, of the child. Mm -hmm. Because while the child is so anxiously caring for the parent, they're not able to attend to their own spontaneous and necessary developmental processes. Uh, and they pick up a lot of excess responsibility and possibly anger and frustration and fear along the way, none of which is good for their own personal development. So. We recognise that this is common, but it does leave a legacy uh, of conflict and difficulties for the child as they mature into adulthood. Okay, thank you for that perspective. Kip, have you got anything to add? To that? I, well, I think just to add, follow on from what um, from what Martha just said, then around the legacy can be carried into adulthood. So I, I generally am working with adult clients, and they can they can still feel a sense of duty and responsibility to their parents um, even you know into well into even middle adulthood and so I think it's sometimes you do have the opportunity to do work with both the the adult and their parent um, but sometimes you just have to work with your client on their own around establishing how this is getting in the way of them living the life that they want and then trying to find a way now to focus more on their goals, their values, what they want their life to be and with using mindfulness and other strategies we use in DBT kind of starting to get a, a sense of um, how they can be more present to their life as it is now and focus on the relationships that are really meaningful for them. Yes. All right, thank you. We do have some time to um, look at some of the other questions that have come up. So we do have one around medication and I guess this is back to you again Martha. You did mention medication is not um, necessarily going to solve a lot of problems for BPD particularly but may be useful for some of the comorbid, comorbid conditions. And we've got a question from Nima Garda, I think you're saying that right. The role of medications such as lamotrigine I don't know if I said that right, to mood stabilising before commencing DBT. Is that something you can comment on? Look, I, I think it is. it can be commonly used uh, in order to stabilise uh, labile intense mood swings. Um, but it has not been shown to be specifically beneficial for core symptoms of BPD and we must remember this. Added to which, lamotrigine has all sorts of well-described, possibly serious side effects. 
So I guess as always, it's a balancing um, process. Um, but I think we need to remind ourselves that the core evidence-based treatment for borderline personality disorder is fundamentally psychotherapy and group therapy rather than medication. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We also had a question about groups. It's like all these questions are linking together, which is really nice. So Blyton asked about, um, it would be interesting to know how you manage borderline personality disorder people, the people with borderline personality disorder might be a good way to say it, in groups. So Martha, you've mentioned that, but Pip, you might do some work as well, mm. and whether or not Fred, yes. you've had a chance to participate in any groups or, or your um, good experience with that. So Pip, do you want to kick off with that and then we'll go around? Yes, thank you. So DBT is it, it, it structures its groups quite well, and we explain the structure of the group really well to our clients. So, and also our clients, we have the luxury of providing full DBT treatment, and we're able to do some pre-treatment sessions before they actually join a group. And those pre-treatment sessions can can kind of prepare the person for for being in a group, start them developing some some ways of managing their arousal even even before they join the group. And then within the group, there's, there's a real structure. So the first half of the group is reviewing homework that was given the week before. Then there's a break. And then the second half of the group is teaching new skills. So the whole focus, the groups tend to be two hours long, and the whole focus for the two hours is on using skills. Um, and if a person does present in a group with, with, a, with a difficulty or, or they start to have um, some emotional arousal, tension within themselves and it's apparent within the group, we can we use skills to manage that even in the group. Um, mm -hmm. And so and uh, so kind of everything is seen as an opportunity for using skills. But the structure of the group really helps and, mm -hmm. and then people get the sense, the people attending the group get the sense that this is about learning skills. It actually seems to help them to step into a more functional way of talking about their life and how they can improve it. Fantastic. So the, the preparation leading up to it sounds really important and, and the structure and careful management. Yes, critical. I I am aware though that a lot, a lot of services do, do just provide groups and might have not have the opportunity to do preparation beforehand. But it is always good to have some form of assessment, some kind of a plan with a person around how they would manage their distress if they found it difficult to be in the group. People can just leave too, just just leave quietly saying, uh, just giving a reason that they just need to take some time out. We, we would encourage people to do that as well. Um, yes. All right, so is, is that something that you would have experience of or um, people that you carers talk about groups or whether they're useful, what helps them work? Any comment about that? I think you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, We've all done that. <laughs> in my experience with my person, um, they had a combination of group therapy and individual therapy, and um, that was a spectrum. Um, both were very useful from two different perspectives in the group. Um, that gave the opportunity for them to have that relational sort of um, work as well as as well, whereas in the individual there was the more intense sort of personal work, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, in the country, it's a lot different. Most of them are actually groups, as Pip was saying, with with not a lot of pre sort of um, assessment, because generally it's your public mental health service that does it and it's clients that are already within the service. So um, they'd have a bit of a run through from their case managers, then they would go go into the group after being assessed if they're suitable for the group, if that makes sense. Um, they are also useful for a lot of people, but then those that struggle with groups, they miss out because they don't get that individual. So to me, that's probably probably the biggest difference. Okay, thank you for that. And Martha, would you have anything to add about group work and benefits or things for people to be aware of? Well, look, I, I think the dismantling studies of Marsha Linehan are quite interesting in this regard. I mean, yes. what she did was she offered 
she compared standard DBT, which is one-on-one -on -one with groups fundamentally, to groups alone or to one-on-one -on -one skill development alone, and they still showed some promise. So sometimes I think we have to be pragmatic and be grateful for whatever therapies are available, even if they're not quite the full package. Yeah, okay. That sounds like a really, really important point. And we, we said one of our learning objectives for tonight was around limitations. And we've, we're hearing throughout the presentation some of the limitations in terms of what's available in different places and different circumstances. So that, that sounds like a really important um, part of our thinking and our work is to, to be open to, to possibilities. And I guess to, to look at what the research says, because it does sound like there's quite a lot there that can give us some hope that there's not just one, one pathway. So thank you. One of the comments that Margaret's made that I think is really important and a really important part of the work of MHPN and whenever we do these panels, I mentioned earlier that we have we always have a range of people from different um, disciplines and of course we can't have all disciplines represented in, in one webinar. But Margaret um, makes a comment that mental health social workers um, are not included in tonight's discussion. Um, and But she wants to make the point that it's, it's good to mention this and has asked us to talk about this because they are allied health professionals who are referred by GPs to work with people under Medicare, including people with borderline personality disorder. So letting people know about that because people might not be aware of it is something that, that Margaret wanted us to mention. So I'd be interested in hearing from each of the panellists as well around this, this sort of idea around um, collaboration, having perhaps, you know, working with others, not, not necessarily seeing our own um, particular discipline or our own way of working is the only way and, and how we might um, collaborate with other, other people. So maybe we'll just go around, maybe we'll start with you again, Pip. How do sure. you see that or what it might look like for you? Well, I've, I've always worked in public mental health services and, and in community mental health teams or yes and so so they can they contain a variety of disciplines um, social work nursing psychology occupational therapy and really the work that we do tends to be um, you know similar like we don't kind of um, we bring a different we, we may bring different approaches to the work but we're really very much doing the same standard work so in our DVD team uh, at the moment in spectrum we have um, a couple of nurses and a rest are psychologists um, but I've definitely worked with occupational therapists and social workers and the team before um, and 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 really it's, it's about the person it's about the, the, the clinician and and the type of therapy that they that works for them that suits their personality and the way they use it to work with their clients um, but I think collaboration between all disciplines there's so much work to do and we all do need to work together uh, and I know that outside of public mental health services um, and even between the public and the private sector and, and liaising with Medicare there needs to be a lot of collaboration and there are a lot of clinicians and therapists in the community who are really um, well trained in working with people with borderline personality disorder. Okay, fabulous. And Fred, what about you? Is that something that, that carers would be sort of aware of and what helps that if you do have a number of different professional workers working with your um, the person and the family, what helps with that or what might people want to be thinking about that can make it work best? Um, I don't think um, a lot of carers would be aware of the dis different disciplines within a mental health team. Um, but in, in my experience, both working as part of a me public mental health team and as a carer, the main thing that they're looking for is that their person is, is looked after and um, the progress is made. I'd like to corroborate everything that Pip said there before. and. Another, another area that's going to become more prevalent as the years go by is also peer workers. Um, they're starting to become part of the workforce more and more as well. Mm, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. And Martha, anything to add to that, just around that collaboration between different professional groups? Look, I think uh, borderline personality disorder is a classic example of multiple forms of therapeutic approaches can be equally effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important uh, at working in this area that we, we remember that. Mm -hmm. And that even if somebody, some other, some of our colleagues uses a different form of therapy, um, the temptation of course is 
is rife or splitting, but provided we can communicate clearly and respectfully and remember that there's not just one way um, to deal with this, then yeah. it can only be for the good. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, that's a great place for us to kind of finish our Q&A. Unfortunately, our time for that is um, coming to an end, but that was kind of where we started with you, Martha, in terms of the different types of um, evidence-based treatments. That there's, there's more than one now that we could be looking at. So we've kind of come full circle. I can see there's still lots of questions that are outstanding um, that we're not going to get to, unfortunately. But I do want to give each of the panellists a, a moment just to perhaps share their take-home message. What is it, after sort of having been through the session, that they would really like people to take away? So, Martha, you okay if I start with you, seeing as you're still there for everyone to see? <laughs> of course, happy to. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's very important for us to remind ourselves that uh, uh, there are many different forms of psychotherapy that really do make a difference for borderline personality disorder. So improvement and recovery can be expected. It's a good news story, not a diagnosis of despair or hopelessness or nihilism. Um, and that's good for patients and therapists alike because theoretically at least, there's so much scope for different approaches. Um, we have the generalist models, which is a good place to start, and then moving on to the more specialised models, if that's available. Uh, so it gives clinicians and patients alike so much scope, yeah. provided the training exists. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic, thank you. And that's a very consistent message we've been hearing through the previous webinars as well, that there is something that everybody can do and certainly being as trained and aware as, as possible, but messages of hope I think have been coming through the last couple of, a couple of webinars as well. So that's, that's very affirming and, and hopefully does give people a sense that we, we can look at this in, in lots of different ways. So, so thank you for that. Fred, let's move on to you and your sort of takeaway message. What would that be? Um, for me, it's two points. First one being that um, families and carers are an integral part of the care team and they need to be included. I'm not saying there would be a, that it's the same in every case. There would be a small percentage of carers who may not, should not be carers. But in the main, um, if you nurture your carers and you make sure they're supported and that they get some education, as I said before, they they can be your greatest asset as a clinician in um, in finding out exactly what's happening with the person and what progress they're making or not making. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. That's a really an important point, and and I think you gave us some really good insights to help people to see some of the things that, that we might need to be thinking about in order to do that work, work well and to, and to set that up. And even your beginning point around carers and, and what that might mean and, and how you kind of think about that mm. role and then how practitioners might set that up as well. So to challenge some of those ideas around what caring, what that role might look like. So, so thank you for that. And what about you, Pip? Let's, let's get on to you and your last sort of parting comments. <laughs> so just. So to follow up on what Martha said about there are many therapies that work and that their message really is one of hope for treatment, um, I think across all treatments, so all evidence-based treatments for borderline personality disorder, there's a core key factor, common factor of, of validation or some term that may be different than validation but something that means that you're communicating to the client that you get them, that you, you, you understand their experience or that what they're saying makes sense in some way. And I do really want to emphasise that because sometimes we can focus more on the change side of a treatment and not as much on the validation we have to have to balance. And sometimes it can be difficult to validate clients because Sometimes the content of what they say can be very exaggerated or, or judgmental, but underneath their words, and that's what we're looking for with validation, we look for what's underneath the words. And um, it can be quite hidden sometimes, but often there's real pain, real fear or anxiety about something, there's real feeling. And when we validate the feeling, it's kind of like that. For the client, it can be give them an enormous relief. It can be transformative if they've had minimal experience of validation in their life previously. I also just want to make a comment about for clinicians working, doing this work, and thinking about Liz, who we had in the case study. She was bringing a lot of she was bringing anger into the room 
with her, with her, not only with her colleagues but also with Sarah, because she was also bringing in her desperateness and her hopelessness. And so, how do we, as clinicians or therapists, manage ourselves with those strong emotions? It's really important to keep having an awareness of how we are ourselves in doing this work because it can be really hard work and can be really challenging to be with somebody else's pain or with their anger. So uh, the most important thing initially is just to be aware of yourself, aware of how you're feeling so that you're mindfully aware rather than reacting or, or acting on your emotion without realising what you're doing. And the usual means of helping our awareness and helping us to manage our feelings are important such as validation, uh, such as supervision, um, reflection and other ways of getting support. That's my yeah. finishing note, thank you. Thank you, and that's your dog, your dog that's having my a dog. finishing note by the yes. time. Yes. <laughs> we expected the dog to do something, so he has. Yep. So that's a really important point. We normally do finish up with um, that message around self-care, so thank you for reminding us about that because we have heard that there's it's complex work and there's lots, lots to it and it is important that we do care for ourselves when we, we are doing yeah. work. So and it's actually valid, uh, a lot of the time it's validating ourselves actually yeah. as well as validating our clients. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Well thank you very much for that. We've got a few minutes just to wind, wind up really now and it's always difficult to get to this point because there's still so much more I know people want to know but we do have more webinars coming up for you. Um, there's also some resources. I said that there'd be some resources that we would talk to you about and here's the, here's the website for you to, to go to. So the Australian Borderline Personality Disorder Foundation have put together some, some resources for you and the practice guidelines that we talked about earlier on that Fred um, mentioned um, will be available there. The previous webinars you can, you can um, look at on the MHPN site. So there, there is the information out there is important. So hopefully you've got some um, some answers to the questions tonight and now you've got, got a chance to get more information if you need it and also more information from our next webinar which will be held on Monday the 23rd of July 2018 and that's the one that's going to be on youth and early intervention. Um, there's always other MHPN webinars as well so you can always um, look at those and make, um, make good use of those as well. MHPN also have practitioner networking opportunities so you can um, look at that website to join your local practitioner network and a number of being established to provide a forum for practitioners with a shared interest in borderline personality disorder. So you can um, visit the website for the news section or contact MHPN to find out more. So when we sort of talk about some of the, the limitations or some of the constraints by having a forum for you to, to share um, your interest with others will be really helpful. Your feedback is really important to us as we um, keep saying so it is important that you do um, look at the survey and, and have a, take a moment to fill that out so that you can do that. So click the feedback survey tab to open the survey and that's really um, as I said really important feedback for us. You will get a certificate of attendance for the web, webinar within the next four weeks and you will be sent a link to the online resources associated with the webinar within the next two weeks so look out for those as well. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you for the contribution and the work that, that's gone in behind the scenes for tonight's webinar to the panellists and to the Redback people and the MHPN people as well. We really appreciate all of that work. And um, for you for joining us and the, the really um, helpful, useful questions that, that came through as well. It, it really adds to, to the experience. So I, I hope it's been a useful experience for people but you've got more opportunities to find out more um, through those ways. So I'd like to um, just close by acknowledging the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you everyone for your contribution this evening and look forward to seeing you next time. Good evening.